Welcome back. It used to happen every few years. Now it seems it's happening every few weeks. A possible government shutdown. In 2013, there was a 16-day shutdown when the Republican Congress tried to force an Obamacare repeal on Obama. Now Republicans controlled the Congress and the White House. Still, the government shut down last month for about a weekend. Uh, and the GOP leaders are now scrambling to avoid another one this week. And joining us for more is former Republican Congressman Dan Miller and our own consumer watchdog, Jerry Zivick, to talk how, about how it might affect you. And Congressman, welcome to the trapezoid. It is an honor to have you here. Thank you. You were in Congress back in 93 or 96 when uh, there was a government shutdown under President Clinton, correct? Right, in 95, 96. It was a fight over the budget, actually, the balance in the budget. And uh, it was the first year Republicans took control of Congress in 40 years, matter of fact, in 95. And what is unusual now is that you, you at, back then, mm -hmm. the Republicans controlled the Congress, yeah. but you had the Democrat president. Same thing a couple of years ago when you had President Obama against a, a Republican Congress. How unusual or strange is it to you that we're dealing with government shutdowns now when Republicans control both the Congress and the White House? Very strange. Now, part of the issue is the 60 vote uh, filibuster issue in the Senate, and the Republicans certainly don't have that. They only have 51 senators. But the bigger part is the challenge of the total budget, and they can't agree on that. There's a very conservative wing of the Republican Party called the Freedom Caucus in the House that is really creating a lot of the problems within the Republican Party. And if you could elaborate, elaborate on that a little bit, does that make it more difficult for Speaker Ryan and more moderate Republicans to try to at least negotiate a compromise with Democrats in the House? Well, it's a fairly conservative Congress, and Speaker Ryan is certainly a conservative. We have 240 Republicans in the House and you need 218 votes to pass something. Uh, there's 30, 35 members in this super conservative. This is the Tea Party crowd that got elected in uh, 2010. Um, and they just are you know, very difficult to deal with. And so if they say no, and you have 205 Republicans want something, they still don't have 218 votes. And the Democratic Party has moved so far to the left, there's no moderates left to kind of negotiate with. It's either all conservative Republicans are all conser liberal Democrats. It's a very difficult situation. Jerry, when the government was shut down last month, it was really only the course of the weekend, and not much was affected that was apparent to the public. But when you look at uh, what can be affected uh, that will have a real impact on the, on the lives of our viewers, what w might that be? Well, we've been, uh, we've been impacted. Everybody thinks we haven't been impacted. What about the cost of preparing for these shutdowns? Any business that has to be shut down, it takes two weeks to prepare an orderly shutdown. So you have to prepare for that two weeks so people aren't being productive during that period of time. Things aren't getting done. So then the government doesn't shut down, and then lo and behold, then you have to get back up to speed on everything that you were preparing to shut down. So there's a tremendous cost in all of this. How much flexibility does the government have? Because if you remember back in 2013 when uh, the government was shut down under President Obama, there was a big kerfuffle over the closing of, of the federal monuments and the federal parks. But this time around, um, the president and the administration said, no, don't worry about that. So it's, it's a false closing because you know, there's a whole list of what's going to be open, what's going to be closed. Almost everything is, is open in some way, shape, or form. So people that are going to a monument and a plan of vacation, in theory, they'll be okay because Congress doesn't want to upset anybody by closing the government. So it, it's really, it, it's a false closing. The people that are really being hurt, though, are the military. So they're out there fighting our wars. Ultimately, they're going to get paid, but they're giving script. So they've got a wife or, or somebody they're supporting, or, or a husband it could be, somebody they're supporting back home, and they need to pay the rent. So that landlord can't, ac can't accept U.S. government script. They need cash because that landlord has to pay bills too. So those people are impacted dramatically. There's no reason that we can't make sure that our military is paid in cash because everything else re remains open. And as we all know, Congress gets paid during a shutdown. Right. And, and, and Congressman, the... A lot of people who are watching this, uh, when they think about a government uh, shutdown, they, they're like saying, good, shut it down. <laughs> if you shut it down, we're not spending money. <laughs> yeah, but there's so many essential you know, services of the federal government. I mean, like passports are not going to be issued. But we've got to issue passports at some stage. So 
when the government shuts down, the passport office will close. It's not essential that they issue passports every day. So the, this, the cemetery here in Florida, in our area, is probably going to shut down, and so they won't be able to do the burials until they reopen. So a lot of inconveniences, and it makes no economic sense. As okay, we are just getting warmed up, and we'll have much more on a possible another government shutdown right after we check the first alert weather. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking about another possible government shutdown this week. And joining us for more is former Republican Congressman Dan Miller and our own consumer watchdog, Jerry Zivic, to talk about how it might affect you. So, Congressman, take me back to when the government shut down while you were in Congress. You were going to the White House trying to negotiate uh, a deal with the Clinton administration. What was that like? How was it different than when the government was open and fully staffed? Well, all non-essential employees have to stay home. You cannot even voluntarily go to work. And so like the White House, uh, the Secret Service will still guard the president, still guard the uh, White House, uh, but the West Wing will have minimal staff. There'll be no visitors in the, or no social occasions taking place. Uh, what the White House used back in 95 and 96 was using a lot of interns uh, because they don't get paid and they could come in. And that's when the most famous intern in history was present there. But uh, uh, the Obama, when they had the Obama shutdown took place, they stopped using interns because of that particular scandal that developed. I wonder what will happen now <laughs> in this White House and well. concern about whatever. Um, but how much pressure does that put on both sides the longer it goes on to strike some kind of deal? A lot of people that are hurt are small business people. And I remember back then, we did uh, the shutdown was in December and January. And so the small operators outside of Yellowstone Park, you know, were, that have a ski, uh, jet ski operation or something, not jet ski, snow ski type operation, they had no business because the park was closed down. Uh, and then the people that do the janitorial service in an office building, they're not federal employees. They don't get a job and work. So a lot of small business people were hurt in, in, in addition to the symbolic closing of the Smithsonian Institution and such. So. Right. And, and Jerry, you know, we talked about uh, military pay. Uh, we talked about uh, parks and, and so forth. But what else would be affected? And I, I'm thinking right now, are Social Security checks and government checks affected by this? Well, the government says no, but I think if it would actually go on for a long period of time, more than a few days, I think ultimately there's going to be a problem. Who's going to make all of these new calculations? for anybody that's new on the rolls or if anybody has a change in the process. But look at Social Security. If you look at people that have applied for Social Security Disability, they wait over two years to get a hearing. And in theory, they're going to have a hearing, but with non-essential personnel, I don't know how, uh, how that's going to be processed once it's in place. So it's not really true. It's, a, it's also tax season. How is that affected? Well, I think we can all agree the IRS can shut down for a while, but <laughs> no, I don't think anybody would complain. But if the IRS doesn't even offer a place to call to get to get, but I, I mean, if you're anymore. filing your returns and expecting a refund on on a fairly short order, well, then it's not going to happen. It, it's going to just sit there and not be processed. Right, and and, and Congressman, I, I guess um, you know you explain the dynamics of how Congress is different now than it used to be. Uh, how does this get resolved in, in terms of if the, the real impediment, at least in the Senate, is the 60 vote threshold that, uh, that you know, a Republican Senate still needs Democratic votes in order to, to make this, uh, you know, this budget resolution go through and keep funding the, the government. If you don't reach some kind of accord in the middle on, on DACA or whatever the other issues are. Well, I, I think we're going to see the, the filibuster go away for appropriation. This is an appropriation bill issue. And there's also the challenge later on this month of the debt ceiling increase, too. So uh, they've already done away with the filibuster for uh, government appointees, the presidential appointees and federal judges. That's been taken care of. So the next step is for these must-pass legislation. There's only very little that must pass every year in Congress. Appropriation bills must pass. And so I think they'll do away with the filibuster on that. And they may do it away with it here in the next month or so. Are, do you, is that a good thing? I think for essential um, uh, past legisla legislation, I think it is, yeah. I think um, the challenge we have now, there are no moderates left in Congress. We have a very conservative Republican Party and a very liberal Democratic Party, and there's nobody in the middle. When I was there in the 90s, 
there was a large group of moderates. There were Blue Dog Democrats, and they called it the Tuesday Lunch Bunch Republicans that were moderate. And these are Republicans from Connecticut and Massachusetts and New York. And, uh, and then you had the Southern Conservative Democrats still there. They're all gone. They all got wiped out in these wave elections. And so now you just have a real conservative party and a real liberal party. And then it's the extremes of both party driving the, the agenda. On the Democratic side, the people most upset with uh, reopening the government were the most liberal senators who are running for president. There's five senators thinking about a presidential run on the Democratic side. So they're pushing it to the left. Our side's pushing it to the right, and we got a problem. And, and Jerry, me, and meanwhile, when we're talking about the public, you, you have, as I mentioned, a lot of people who might be watching this right now saying, keep it closed. On the other hand, you have a lot of people who have whether it's uh, you have a loved one who may have to be buried at, at a national cemetery or people concerned about their social security checks or their passports who are looking at this and just saying, um, I mean, this isn't right. Well, I, I don't want to talk politics, but our society has lost the ability to agree to disagree. You know, we've lost the ability to find compromise. And I think it's going to be a tragedy if we do away with the filibuster because that protects the minorities in a situation like that. But it's not, it's the veterans too. What about these veterans hospitals? At some point, even though they're pre-funded with, with money, they're going to run out of money and they're not going to be able to take care of our veterans in the hospital. This is just a terrible situation. What about the CDC? We have this rampant flu going around and there'll, there'll be nobody really to, to really take care of, of people and monitor what's going on or, and look for health solutions or the, or the opioid crisis what's going to happen with that I mean we have a, people that are dependent upon our government and for them to even think about closing it, it's just terrible in fact congressman I was reading in terms of the CDC's budget you know we have teams in a lot of countries around the world that are monitoring the outbreaks of disease that could theoretically affect us here at home those teams are not going to be uh, funded they're going to be withdrawn from those com uh, countries and you, you might want to say well what, what's the CDC doing overseas anyway in places like Africa or, or elsewhere but they have a, a real impact in terms of stopping diseases from right. spreading to here. Right. right. They, I don't think they'd be withdrawn. They just wouldn't be able to go to work is what they're going to be told to do. They'll just say, just stay in the hotel or stay in your apartment or something until we reopen the government. So every agency of the government gets to set their own rules of who is essential and who is not essential. And so uh, the CDC, because of the flu outbreak, may declare a larger number of people essential. We'll you know, see. But when you were in Congress, uh, did membership on your side and membership on the other side uh, fully appreciate the, the impact that the closing of the government was going to have on the lives and, and, the, and the futures of, of Americans? I don't think so, but it, after a couple of weeks, we started realizing it. As I say, the, the small business people that were hurt in resort areas where national parks were closed or such, or the people that had the service contracts of office buildings or such, or places near military bases uh, that did the uh, small restaurants or such, they were all affected. And all of a sudden, that started saying, hey, a lot of people are impacted by the federal government shutdown, and they don't get recovered. Uh, federal employees will get retroactive back pay, so they'll all get their pay, not by law, but when Congress opens, reopens the government, they'll retroactively pay everybody. But that doesn't pay that little restaurant that lost all the business. Now, they said that last month when the government was shut down that the Democrats caved fairly quickly. They didn't have the stomach for it, but usually how are these shutdowns resolved? What is going on in leadership that, that they, that uh, results in, in them saying, okay, now it's time to, to reach out and maybe do things that, you know, otherwise you wouldn't want to do. Sometimes it's poll driven. If they, I think the Democrats realized they were getting blamed for this last shutdown, and so they needed to have some face-saving measure, and that's when they got an agreement to bring up DACA. DACA is not going to be the big issue this time. The big fight right now is an increase in the defense appropriations that, are, that Republicans want, and Democrats are supportive of, too, a big increase in defense. But what the Democrats want is an equal increase in non-defense discretionary spending. That's where the fight is over, and it's going to blow the budget. The headline today on Politico is House GOP scrambles to avoid shutdown. Republican leaders face arrest of rank-and-file uh, you know, members of Congress before the funding deadline. 
Right. A lot of it is the defense hawks on the Republican side. They've been promised they're going to have a significant increase in defense spending, and they can't keep waiting. They say, we need this additional money. You know, General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, says, you know, we need this money. And, you know, by just uh, having continuing resolutions, the additional defense money is not coming. So, Okay. We have to take a quick break, and we'll be back for final thoughts in a moment. And our guests join us right now for final thoughts. So, Jerry, if you were to tell our viewers what they might see if the government shuts down once again this week, what would that be? I think they, they would see, as the, congressman, the former congressman points out, businesses will be impacted. Their vendors, people that they deal with on a daily basis, they're going to be impacted. So the price of their goods actually might go up because that vendor or that seller needs, needs to stay in business. So as a consumer, we're at risk to possibly have our prices go up. I, I don't think our police will be impacted. I think we have a tremendous risk in terms of uh, this opioid crisis. I don't think there'll, there'll be help for people which can increase crime. I think the CDC is impacted. I think ultimately if it goes more than two weeks, your social security disability check will be impacted, not your disability check, your retirement check will be impacted. I think veterans, their health care will be impacted. And there's a high cost for all of us to have nothing be done and yet pay for it. Congressman, would you predict that um, they're going to find some way to avoid this over the next couple right. of days? I think they were, everybody was embarrassed the way the last one lasted. It only lasted, of course, three days. And so I think there's agreement to try to get something worked out. They're probably going to, unfortunately, do like a one-month CR, the continuing resolution, until later on in March. And then they'll have, you know, the crisis again. But I think there's an agreement. The big fight is over more discretionary spending. It's not the DACA issue. Well, let me ask you this question. You know, I, I'm old enough to remember the day that once, uh, you know, a, a cycle, the president delivered a budget of the United States, <laughs> and it would go to Congress, and you would have something called hearings on it and appropriation bills. Uh, how did we get so far away from that? The whole budget process has fallen apart in, in Washington. And they haven't been able to do a budget for years. Uh, I served on the Appropriations Committee and the Budget Committee, so I, I was close to it. And, it's, and Appropriations does oversight work, and they're not doing the oversight work because they can't even agree on numbers. And so um, the problem is getting, <laughs> getting a, a basic agreement on numbers. And it's unfortunate with one party in total control, they can't even govern. Okay, we'll have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Before we go, we want to share with you what some of you had to say about Friday's show on the week in Washington. President Trump gave the order to release the now declassified memo written by Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee. The president claims there is evidence the Department of Justice and the FBI relied on politically biased sources to obtain court orders to do surveillance on Trump campaign staffers. We went to Facebook to hear what you thought. Sam says, sounds like it's time for a special prosecutor to investigate and prosecute corruption in both the FBI and the DOJ. Kevin says, from the party who claims to honor and stand up for law enforcement to jumping off the deep end for Trump so he doesn't get sent to prison. And Diana says, ridiculous. This whole fiasco was a total waste of time. Both parties need to start doing their jobs instead of acting like children. Well, if you'd like to join the conversation on tonight's topic, just visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash mysuncoast.com.abc7. FYI, you can watch past discussions on demand. They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. And for the latest on local breaking news, don't forget to download the updated version of our app. If your current app doesn't work, it's expired. Just go to the App Store and re-download it by searching for WWSB or My Sun Coast. We want to thank both our guests for being here tonight, former Republican Congressman Dan Miller and our consumer watchdog Jerry Zivick for joining us tonight.